Hi, I'm Max Temkin, one of the co-creators of Cards Against Humanity, and this is Tabletop Deathmatch, a competition to find the next great tabletop game. Last year, over 500 people submitted their unpublished games to a panel of expert judges. 16 finalists came to Gen Con to pitch their games in person, and one of those games will win a first printing paid for by Cards Against Humanity and be named the champion of Tabletop Deathmatch. I'm Kelsey Dominey. And I'm Mike Dominey. And our game is The Amberton Affair. The Amberton Affair was conceived about two years ago, uh, just one afternoon, um, and it's been kind of our baby ever since. It's, <laughs> it's, it's gone further than anything else that we've ever designed, and uh, it's been a fun process, but yeah, it's been about two years in the making to get to this point. We have been making games together for the majority of our marriage. The first two years that we were married, we traveled with a company that took us across the country and we just lived out of a van, uh, literally, which totally stifled our, all our creativity. We had no outlet. We had one deck of cards. <laughs> and that was it. So after we had played about a thousand rounds of Euchre, we decided to uh, play board games and design board games. So we went and got craft supplies and... Index cards and pieces of paper <laughs> and anything Lots of find. markers and crayons so that we would <laughs> craft and make board games in our hotel rooms whenever we had spare time. And all that has just bloomed into weekly game nights at the Dominies in our apartment. And we're known by our friends as the people who make games. Those and people. Yeah. Those people. <laughs> Kelsey doesn't like to lose. She's a bad loser, and I I'm a youngest child. <laughs> and I'm an oldest child, so I don't like to win all that much and make people feel bad. So we do best with the games that we can actually play together and win or lose together. Uh, and uh, we also do enjoy designing those. It's a, it's a different kind of challenge to find a way for the yeah. game to beat you. Thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, we're really excited to hear about the Amberton Affair. Why don't you tell us about the game? My name is Mike. I'm Kelsey. And my name is Drake. And we're the designers of the Amberton Affair. Now the setting is early 1900s in England and a grand soiree is being held at the esteemed Amberton Manor. There are several distinguished dignitaries in attendance, including the governor's wife, the baron, and the general. Now players are playing the staff of busy footmen that are running around the party trying to fulfill all the requests of the orders of these dignitaries. One of the players will be getting the miscreant's imposter card. It is the miscreant imposter's job to find poison within the room and kill off the dignitaries before the end of the party without getting caught by the other footmen. There are a number of item cards and they are placed in certain locations in the room. There are items that start at the door. There's a number of items that start at a desk. Food items, hors d'oeuvres at the hors d'oeuvres table. A number of drinks and messages at the bar. And uh, a number of coats in the coat room. And in the center space is the butler. Also, there are a number of items that are randomly assigned at the beginning of each round. You don't know where they're going to start. They're marked by a little question mark on the bottom uh, left-hand side of the card. Included in here are the three poisons that are integral to the game. Now, the game is played simultaneously, okay? So all players are going to be playing at the same time using three actions. An action uh, can be any of the following. Uh, you can move your piece one space on the board. If you are at a uh, location such as the hors d'oeuvres table, you can look at the pile, look for the item you need, take it, add it to your hand. And if you're at a dignitary, you can look at whatever pile that dignitary has accumulated up to that, that point and uh, take an item from your hand and add it to the pile. You can also, uh, if you're at the center butler space, take the top order card. And the order cards have, are telling you where to go uh, and do what. So for example, please retrieve a quill and paper from the desk and take it to the baron so you have the item, where to find it on the board, and uh, who to deliver the item to. The miscreant imposter has to find those three poisons that were dealt out randomly throughout the room and deliver them to the dignitary for whom it is intended. Now, this, uh, in light of this, the footman playing must follow those poisons and follow the other players' movements to try to get a clue as to who is playing the imposter. If you get a clue as to who the imposter may be, you have rumor tokens. You're going to spread rumors in the rumor mill. So you have rumor tokens to play into the rumor mill. If you think you know something, or if you have no idea but you just want to throw everybody else off, that's okay too. The round comes to an end one of two ways. First of all, these time tokens could be depleted after each turn of three actions each. 
one of those is taken away. If it gets to the bottom and they're out, then the round is over. It can also come to a close when the number of rumor tokens comes to the given limit. Depending on how many people there are, that tells you how many rumors there are to uh, end the round. When the round's over, players go into an accusation phase. They'll take a little slip of paper, write down who they believe to be the imposter. And so once all the accusations are made and they are revealed, and our identities are revealed, you laugh at people who've been making dumb choices throughout the game, and then you go to scoring. Okay, and at scoring, you get points quite simply for every order that you uh, complete. The points are given on that card. You also uh, get points as the miscreant imposter for every poisoning that you do. If you have accurately accused the imposter, you get 20 points per token that you've played that round for a total of 60. Now, if you are wrong, each one is minus 10. You play three such rounds. You restart the board with all the items, you reassign identities, and after three rounds, the person with the highest cumulative score wins the game. When we got the email that we were in the top 16 of over 500, I freaked out and I couldn't stop smiling <laughs> for like a week. So it was, uh, it was one of those fall off the couch moments because you got so excited. Yeah, um, we, we realized even at that <laughs> point, like. Obviously, we would like to win the contest, uh, but even at that point, if nothing else happened, just the fact of being a finalist in a national competition is a huge deal and was a huge boost for us. I think the biggest part of it um, has been the confirmation that it's like, yeah, we mm -hmm. did make a good game. We just have to put it out there and we need some professional feedback. We need some people who know what they're talking about to tell us what they think. The, definitely the, the first thing that I think is really striking about this is just how finished it is. Like you guys even have the box over there. Can you talk a little bit about like where you are in the design process and, and what's gone into the, the design and the production so far? Yeah, sure. It's uh, two years in the making. It was, uh, yeah, the whole idea was conceived a little over two years ago. And uh, this is probably the, the third major version of the game. Um, I, I personally do the artwork myself and we've been working with a great print and play option online to, uh, to print out some really nice prototypes, really uh, quality cards. At this point, really, we've play tested hundreds of rounds and uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's good to go. Uh, we're, we're looking for some more professional feedback and for more uh, reviews. Something uh, that is very important for me in like in intrigue-based games, because my play group, we like, it's our kryptonite, we love intrigue-based games. Um, but we play them a lot over and over again, and you start to see sort of strategies that work out in particular. Um, with your game, because everything is scored differently, uh, how much has that been tweaked? Uh, like, how difficult is it for the miscreant to actually win versus the other players? Divvying out the point system was probably the most difficult thing to figure out how to balance the game that way. Uh, but through our many play tests, We've had people who never played the Miscreant Imposter end up winning just because they were that good at uh, accusing or that good at getting a whole bunch of orders done. Um, or a very successful Miscreant Imposter who doesn't get guessed by anybody and poisons everyone, they should win and they usually do. Uh, can you tell me about how long it takes to play a single round of the game? It probably takes between 10 and 15 minutes. You can play a complete game of three rounds, 45 to an hour. On the note of the Miscreant, um, A, can the Miscreant win by not poisoning anybody and just doing orders? And B, what would the miscreant do if somebody else went and got all the poisons? If the miscreant imposter goes without poisoning anybody, they receive zero points for the round regardless of how many orders were completed. If they poison at least one person, they get points for that, plus any order cards that they completed at the same time. What would happen if somebody else picked up all the poison? If you have three, four players, all of the three players have the poison, is there any way for the miscreant to get the poisons? There is a limit to your hands. You can only hold two, two item cards at one time. So while someone could go around and pick up two of the poisons, um, and a third person could pick up the third poison if they wanted to, then they're incapable of doing much else because you have very limited time and very limited um, availability to, to fulfill your own orders. The rumor tokens, you said you uh, the, the round ends when the rumor token stat gets to a certain height, is that correct? Okay, uh, why would I want to accelerate the game with those rumor tokens? Why would I want to, to hasten the end of the round? There is, if you're in one of the later rounds, or even in the beginning round, and it seems like the miscreant imposter is is getting away with it, or if there's one person whose score is higher than yours, and you happen to get three 30-point objectives right off the bat done really quickly, you may want to end the round sooner to keep everybody else from being able to score more points. When you're doing the fetch quest step of, of this, and you're going around finding, uh, you, you've gone to the butler and gone, and anyway, are you tracking 
anything else or are you just completing your turn, doing the card draw and then moving on? Is there anything I'm doing during my turn other than processing my turn? On the board, on paper, that's all you're doing. Uh, but the game more is up here where um, as you're going about those orders, it's a memory game really to remember where you've found uh, poisons in the past, where they're going and who's been there. What is table talk like in this game? It's fun to see different personalities play because we've seen people just be silent and not want to give away anything. Um, I like to talk a lot as you may have noticed. Um, so I like to just act differently in every round, whether I'm the miscreant or not, to throw people off. Um, I've gotten him to think I was the miscreant before just because I'm saying, hey, I may have poisoned somebody, you may want to check it out. Um, so it really depends on personalities, which is, makes it a lot of fun. Thanks again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for hosting. Thank you. The Emberton Affair is not done if it doesn't go to uh, win the contest. Uh, mm -hmm. We would like to go kickstart it, and we've made a whole lot of connections, a lot of friends here who, who I would expect would be huge proponents of the game. So, uh, what do you guys what do you guys think? I'm I'm pretty impressed by just uh, how far they they brought the game. I basically. like any any game with traders. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's funny cool. you say that, right? Because cool. I can see about three of my games in this, <laughs> right? I mean, like like there's some betrayal, and there's a little bit of the the Pathfinder game with the the. It's like it's got all the things that I l liked putting in those games, and so the fact that they're like all here, and yet there's all this new stuff on top of it that I haven't seen before. I mean, I think I, I, I think they, they hit everything they wanted to hit. Well, I think there's actually something really interesting about the, the way the game plays, because what you do, according to how they said, is you act at the same time. You've got your own tasks, yep. but you can't actually reveal the traitor. Like a lot of the games with traitors, you reveal the traitor and that's either game end or that's when that player's out or what have you. This, you can't stop the traitor from doing what he does at all, right? The, the, the biggest concern I have is just that everyone's acting simultaneously and you're doing these fetch quests and there's a lot of cards. There's a lot to remember. And like I, I think it has to be very hard to actually track where the poisons are, where they're moving, you may never even see the poison. And I think right? that's I think that's part of the game. I mean, I think yeah, oh, the yeah. fact that there's that fog of war built into this game is probably pretty crucial yep. to the game. Um, I, I I think they clearly I'll, I'll bet that they went through a step where it wasn't simultaneous play, like it was all turn based, and they later went, wait a minute, you know. This we can keep track of everything that's in this game. We know it. We know it. so we have to kill that somehow, and that was a pretty clever way to do it. So often when you play intrigue-based games, it sucks if you're not the person who's like the traitor right. because it's not as fun to right. be the other mm -hmm. people. I like how in this game you get in a couple another round to maybe be the miscreant, but it also seems like you have your own agendas and your own secrets, even if you're not the miscreant, yep. and it yep. makes it a little bit more broad. So you're not like bummed out when you don't draw the miscreant card. If I have to find a negative. Um, it's that in this game, in this type of game, what you want is lively table talk, right? If it is a play everything close to your chest, don't reveal anything. What you haven't created is a dinner party. The rumor mechanic um, still seems a little, a little weird. Tacked on. Well, I, so I didn't understand it at first. I think, I think yeah, it, at first it's a little weird, and it feels to me like you could use that to encourage yeah. more table yeah, talk. Yeah, I think so. I think, I think there's, there's a, a tiny step missing in this game but it's really tiny yeah yeah the, there's the the big concern i have about specifically about the trader mechanic is like you know think of, of the resistance like the resistance hits that sweet spot yep. and it gives you just enough information to be like tantalizing about the other players but not quite enough that you exactly know and that's really hard like i have worked on games with trader mechanics where you could just never get the mechanics to the place where they hit that sweet spot and i think um you know, it, it it would be. It's hard for me to tell without without a lot of play testing. Like, did, did they, they hit it? Did they hit it? Yeah. Are they giving players enough that they have that really engaging table talk and that accusation, um, or is it is it just, you know, like you said, like fog of war, and and you kind of are are just speculating. This is this is close enough that a, a little time in development, and these guys spent a lot of time in development, right? But but a little outside analysis mm -hmm. probably benefits the game. A little bit, right? Probably gets it from 
uh, an eight out of ten to a nine out of ten, and that's I think where we're talking, yeah. right? Yeah. And and so, so yeah, I mean, and and they're ready to they're they're like ready to go. Like they may not be where they think they are, but they're pretty close to where we think they should. Be. Yeah, this is a, an advanced prototype. I I love this from a manufacturing standpoint because the board is little. Um, there's no expensive components that I can see in this game at all. So, and the, and the graphics are, are very nice, so it's going to have a nice high perceived value mm -hmm. while the cost of the game is going to be extraordinarily low. Yeah. yeah, they made a clever decision. I didn't notice that until you said it. They made a clever decision. There's no component in the box that's bigger than the box. Right. right? Nothing here has to fold. Nothing here has to tuck away. Anything like that. That's I love the way neat. they have the sideboards. It's, yep. it's just a great decision for manufacturing. Yeah, let me tell you the thing that impressed me most about this pitch, though, is that they were able to answer every single one of my questions yeah. with an answer that satisfied me. And I was hitting them with basically, these are the things that popped up right away as development questions. This is not something they've just thrown together. They have spent a lot of time playing playing this game. Not just mm -hmm. testing, but playing their game, which is crucial with, with game development. I'd publish this tomorrow. The Amberton Affair has been created under the name of Two Penny Games, and Two Penny Games came up with the name because of a story that's in the Bible, in the book of Luke. There's a widow who gives all that she has in the form of two small copper coins, and, and even though that wasn't significant at all, she was blessed greatly for her sacrifice, and so we're using the name Two Penny Games as a reminder of that widow's sacrifice and knowing that whatever we do how insignificant it may be. Designing games isn't that big of a deal in the world, but uh, we're, we want to do it all for the glory of God. And whether someone believes in that or chooses not to, uh, the truth is that there are orphans and widows, women and children all over this globe who need hope. And it is our desire that any success that Two Penny Games has shares financially with organizations that support widows and orphans across the country and world.